wondering why there's nothing on the screen. The operator of the computer is defective. The computer is fine. Unfortunately, you know, hit it. To operator. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. I have, a faulty, I have a faulty operator and it had nothing to do with Louise. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Anyway, it's such a wonderful thing to see everybody here today. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. God is so good. We need to look, we need to look at the Lord. We need to look at the Lord because circumstances occur and circumstances happen in our lives. And here's the thing. We can be distracted by our circumstances. We can be distracted by presence. We can be distracted by these things. Or we can go and we can look up to God and there can be a liberty in this place like never before. So we want, what we want to do is we want to keep our eyes and our focus on Jesus Christ. And in doing so, allow Him to do the work. You know, there's something that came to me in prayer actually this morning before we even get into the crux of the message. Something that came to me is that God's truth is absolute truth. You know what fights against God's truth? Right here. This piece of matter right between my ears, between our ears. That's what fights against it. What fight, you know what fights against God's truth? A heart. Our hearts, our feelings, our thoughts, these things fight against God's truth. So what happens is we don't end up experiencing the presence of God when we have a whole lot in our heart, our mind, or our spirit. That's why God called us to lay our burdens down before Him, then go into a place to worship, because that's where healing can happen. That's when the spirit can become whole. That's when good things and blessings can happen. That's when our eyes can be open. Amen? Hallelujah. And we're in part four of our sermon series, Head Games. It just happened to be Head Games. Because a lot of times things happen in our lives. Things that we expect, things that we don't expect. Sometimes we can know God but not know ourselves and that cause us to be separated from God. Because we don't know the degree, sometimes like Moses didn't know the degree of anger that he had. Moses didn't realize that he was, he was not able to set boundaries to set himself apart so that he could speak to the rock. He ended up smiting the rock. Why? Because he got emotionally involved. He knew God but he didn't know himself. Same thing with David. David knew God, but he didn't know himself. He didn't realize that a greed for so many other people and so many other women would cause an issue and a problem in his household that would never go away. Solomon knew that mixing too much could be a problem. How do you know he knew? Because every king had the law read to him and he had to acknowledge and know it. But growing up in a household with David and Bathsheba became problematic. Because maybe he looked at himself as the issue as a problem. And that became an issue throughout his life. So he used a relationships with women as medication instead of fellowship and it ended up coming to his ruin we looked last week at lot to lose a lot and sometimes there are friendships sometimes there are people that we might have known in the past and we say well maybe i should i i, I should reconnect with this individual but god sometimes allows a severance for a season or a time to happen so that you can be meet to minister to that individual Because Abraham, Abram could not become Abraham until Lot had left. But when Abram became Abraham, Lot was able to become restored. It couldn't happen. So God superintends 
friendships, relationships, and seasons in our lives for our optimal growth and His glory. Amen? And now we're in the fourth part of the series. And we're going to be looking at a past in Scripture and we're going to be talking about something that you wouldn't think could become a problem or a headache. And we're going to be opening up in the Bible to Jeremiah chapter 20. If you have a Bible, you can open up there or you can just listen right now, especially with the IT man that we have that needs to be fired. Jeremiah chapter 20. And we're going to read reading from verse 7 to verse 9. The Bible says, You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, <clears throat> his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. <clears throat> Precious Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask, O oh, Heavenly Father, that your word would come in, it would germinate, and it would take root in our hearts. Let our hearts be good, fertile ground for growth, for strength, to honor and to bless your name, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in the last installment of our sermon series called Head Games, and I would like to present an idea that encapsulates the principle we're about to learn. And that is, it's one thing to expect difficulties as a result of our errors. Everybody makes mistakes. But it's one thing to expect difficulties as a result of our errors. And it's another thing when we get difficulties as a result of obeying God. Let me say that again for all you note takers. I think this is really important. It's one thing to expect difficulties as a result of our errors. It's another thing when we get difficulties as a result of obeying God. Wow. See, many of us made mistakes in the past. Many of us had good and bad relationships. Many of us tried different things that did not always end the way we expected it to end. <clears throat> Many of us have done things and gone through maybe career paths that we wish we didn't go through or had have hard times or may even still be having a hard time in. Many of us might have had done things and neglected people that we wish we wouldn't have neglected. Sometimes you can hear that kind of thing. You can hear that kind of thing in the man who's, whose wife passed away many years ago and had risen, was continued to go moving forward. And the one thing he's, this man says to his son is, son, I want you to love your wife. I don't want you to take advantage or put Dacre for granted. Because one day she might be gone. Don't worry about the petty stuff. Amen. Because petty stuff has a way of, of, of 
coming in between. That was the words that were said to me by, by my father concerning my mother. I wish I would have had just one more opportunity to tell her I love her. But that opportunity is never going to come on this side of eternity. So there are many difficulties and many things that happen in our lives because of whether we were incapable of, whether we didn't have the insight, whether we didn't realize it, or whether we have taken things for granted. There are many things, many errors that cause difficulties in our lives. But the question that we're, and that we're emphasizing today is what do you do? What do you do when the issue and problem and difficulties that are coming into your life happen as a result of your obedience to God? What do you do when all of a sudden you're being obedient and all of a sudden the world starts blowing apart? There's somebody who had to deal with it. But I want to say this. Simply put, every divine calling is accompanied with a unique set of difficulties. When God calls you. There's no such thing as a problem-free space. Think about it even in your life. Anytime. Where's a problem-free place? Where? I'd like to know where it is. Because there's no such thing. Whenever you change positions, you're simply exchanging one set of issues for another. How many know that's true? When you're changing jobs, you have different challenges. In changing places, there are different people you have to deal with. Whenever there's a change in your life, there's a new set of challenges that end up coming your way. And when you go from single to married, you will experience the absence. You will not experience the absence of problem. You have exchanged one set of problems for another. When you transition from working for someone else to working for yourself. You will not experience the absence of problems. You will have exchanged one set of problems for another. And it's important for us to understand this. Or we will not understand our divine calling or be able to carry out the calling that God has for our lives. Because you could assume that you could have a calling but your calling cannot be and will not be without a cross. I'm going to say that again. Because I think that this is important. If you have a calling, there is no such thing as a calling without a cross. Jesus said, if any person wants to follow me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So now the question that arises is what is the cross? What is a cross? Help me to understand, Pastor. I hear about all this religious terminology, but I really don't understand. I want to understand it. I want to internalize it. Let me tell you, the cross is simply a metaphor, and I want to tell you this, what it really is, what the meaning is and the implications are. But I want to state this, that there are three types of inconveniences in life. And every inconvenience and problem and trouble comes from one of these three things. Guaranteed. There isn't a fourth. This is it. First is storms. Second is thorns. And third is crosses. Believer and non-believer alike. Storms, thorns, and crosses. All of our trouble fits within one of those categories. It's either a storm, thorn, and cross. See, a, th a storm is a temporary season of inconvenience intended to be used by the enemy to get us to act impulsively. See, because the enemy knows that once you start to act impulsively, you're not thinking about your actions. 
Desire impulse, impulsivity in the storm can destroy us when the storm can't. God might have you, but your impulses might destroy you. <clears throat> it's a temporary season of inactivity. Some storms are just going to have to, you're just going to have to outlast them. And you're just going to have to look and let everything go until the end. And at the end, you count the damages and you lick your wounds. you got to make a decision at one point. Because you can say to the storm this. Somebody's going to quit first. Either the storm or you. And listen to me. I don't intend to quit. And I want to encourage you, don't quit in the midst of a storm. Because two things can happen. Either a storm can uproot you and destroy you, or you can start to dig in deeper and have depth in the midst of a storm. Because eventually, at some point, something's got to shift. And something's got to change. And when it shifts and changes, it'll still, I'll still be standing. Let me ask you, will you... Eventually, you're going to have a stare down with your storm. And let that storm know I've come too far to turn around now. That's the storm. But then there's also the thorn. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. We talked about it Thursday night. Because of these surpassingly great revelations... Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. If you like the King James, buffet me. He calls this unidentified issue a thorn. A thorn, what it is, this is an instrument of agitation that's sent by the enemy that's intended to cause me to abandon my calling. It's an instrument of agitation that's sent by the enemy that's intended to cause me to abandon my calling. The word torment implies continuous attack, or apparently continuous. It's that thing that might be playing back and forth in your mind over and over and over again. You almost got no car accident now. All of a sudden, you're replaying something almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's happening over and over again. Now all of a sudden, you're saying different things inside your mind. And things are playing inside your thoughts. And now all of a sudden, emotions are getting involved. And now all of a sudden, your day and your whole idea and your thoughts are ruined. It's a thorn and it continues to hit you. To buffet me is like to punch. It's like being in a it's like being in a corner and finding yourself in a rope of dope, trying to trying to outlast the other boxer, hoping that the other boxer would grow tired. Well, I found something out about our enemy. I found something out about the devil. He don't get tired. He continues to try to attack and attack and attack. Until you withstand. Let me say this. The thorn is not killing me, but it's just bothering me. It's a nagging issue that the enemy sends to try to get me to abandon my calling. He tries to get me to give up. He'll tell you continuously, you don't have to take this. Why don't you just simply walk away? Why continue to fight? Why continue to fight? Just walk away. Why hold on? Just walk away. See, that's the thorn. But then there's the cross cross. What is the cross? All you note takers, write this down. The cross 
is the inconvenience that you choose to endure because you value your calling and relationship with God more than comfort. I hope you heard that. The cross is the inconvenience you choose to endure because you value your calling and relationship with God more than comfort. It might be more comfortable not to say anything to that person. But God calls you to be a witness. It might be uncomfortable to take, to allow promotions to pass you by because you insist on serving God and taking off on Sunday. That's a cross. There are particular relationships that people don't like you because you're serving and following and worshiping God and you don't want to turn to the left nor to the right. That's a cross. You can pick up the cross and you can lay it down. It's something you have control over. You see, you're not in control of the storm. Storms are going to happen to you. Regardless of whether you're ready or not, storms are going to happen. Thorns, you're not in control of the thorn. A thorn's going to happen. The enemy's going to send it against you. Because you're created in the image of God. But you are in control of the cross. And there's no such thing as a calling without a cross. If you're called to serve God in any particular capacity, there is going to be a cross there. There is going to be attack on you. There is going to be attack on your enemy. There is on your in your family. There is going to be attack on you. Emotionally, spiritually, financially. See, because there's no such thing as a problem free place. If you're alone, there's a problem. If you're with somebody, there's a problem. If you're around different people, there are different problems. If you're around even different people from there, there's different problems. There's no such thing as a problem-free space. So why is it that somehow or another, sometime or another, we expect a particular place without a set of problems to deal with? Jeremiah had that. It's simply exchanging one set of problems for another. And what we are examining today in this passage of scripture is the reality that there are some callings today that are creating headaches, not because of the call itself, but because of the way we see it. How we see things, the lens by which we look at things. You can't be hurt by something that you don't love. If you don't love something, you're indifferent. Maybe there's nothing wrong with your calling. Maybe there's something wrong with the way you're seeing it. And some misery comes from misunderstanding the call. And we have a powerful picture of this in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's calling was one of the most profound callings in scripture. Because God speaks to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1. And he's saying to him, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. You see, before I formed you in my mother's womb, I knew you. See, God has a plan for your life. And the only thing that stops that plan from going forward is this. The flesh. 
Because the flesh wants its thing. And what happens is the flesh has a tendency of ignoring God, regardless of whether it knows that that's best. Because the flesh wants what the flesh wants. Everything you have was wired in at conception. Your thoughts, your likes, your dislikes, personality, your giftings. God says, I formed you before you were born. We may have dysfunction, but we don't have deficit. Because he formed us with everything we need to live and walk victoriously. And when we're not walking victoriously, the reason why we're not walking victoriously is because we're fighting against God. The Bible says the flesh is at enmity with the Spirit. So you were intended, and everyone in this room and everyone watching is intended to live and walk in victory. And what God does is he says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I sanctified you. I have ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah then said, I can't do that. I'm but a youth. Meaning he was inexperienced. And meaning he did not know how to go about it. And God didn't deny the reality of Jeremiah's inexperience. But God calls you and he expects you to walk. When the Israelites were coming out and they were going to go into a place called the, the Promised Land, he said, send the Ark of the Covenant before you. Let it go 200 feet before you. Why? Because you have never been this way before. I'm going to be taking you to places that you have never been before. And if you follow and if you trust me, you will find that amazing things are going to start to happen to your life and you are going to happen to somebody else's life. And that's going to be an amazing thing. He didn't deny the reality of Jeremiah's experience, nor ours. He just stopped him from speaking those limitations. He stopped him from saying it. Why stop him from speaking it? Because you talk to yourself more than anybody talks to you. You talk to yourself more than your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. You talk to yourself more than God. So your voice is powerful and most prevalent in your mind. When you think, you think in your voice. You don't think in Morgan Freeman's voice. Now, Susan. I want you to go for it. No, you don't have that kind of, that's a bad imitation, please. That was his flesh. Uh, that was a bad imitation of uh, Morgan Freeman. But see, you don't, you don't have different voices in your head. You have your voice in your head. I have my whiny voice in my head. That's what I hear all the time. Now you know why I um, give Advil all the business. Your voice is constantly in your head. He didn't say you're not young. He just said don't say it. Because ultimately you don't realize that you're talking to yourself and that you can talk yourself in or out of anything and everything. That's why the flesh is so powerful. And that's why the, the voice of the enemy is so powerful also. Because the voice of the enemy teams up with your emotions and circumstances and the things you've done before to try to talk you into what you've always been the enemy will never take you to somewhere new. The enemy will always take you back to a particular place. He won't take you to new heights. Not for your benefit and benevolence. So it's important for us to know how to talk to ourselves. You need to know how to talk to you. You need to know how to speak in your heart and mind. You need, and how do you do that? Let me tell you. By proclaiming the word of God over your life. When you proclaim the word of God over your life, things change. Because you need to know that you're the head, not the tail. 
You need to know that you're the lender and not the borrower. You need to know that you're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You need to know that you're blessed and highly favored in Christ. That you are accepted in the beloved. That no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You need to know that you are the victor. These are important things. Paul says it in Philippians 4, 8, that these things do I think on that which is good, that which is pure, that which is holy, that which is right. These things we need to set our mind upon because what happens is we'll start to speak those things into our lives and that will change our trajectory and our face, our outlook, our demeanor. We need to break some self-sabotaging behavior and some destructive habits. He said, Jeremiah, you're inexperienced, but don't keep repeating your limitations. Don't keep going back to the things that caused the issue and the problem in the first place. Because, it's, because all it's doing is creating and cementing limited beliefs. And you might wonder why I can't go further in Christ. Why can't I go and live in victory? Am I believing something about myself that's a lid? Am I, be, am I denying things about myself that I should be bringing before the cross? God says, I'm going to be with you. You're going to pull down and you're going to root up and Jeremiah says, okay, you call me and I'm going to do all these things for you. I'm in. Sign me up. He accepted the calling of God in his life. That's Jeremiah chapter 1. But then we read chapter 20. This is a little bit later in life. A lot transpired between chapter 1 and chapter 20. And Jeremiah said, you deceived me. See, he's talking one way in chapter 1 and he's talking another way in chapter 20. He's talking one way before the wedding, but now he's talking another way after 20 years married. She's talking one way when she started the job. She's talking another way five years in. Things have changed and transpired in our lives that cause us to change. He says one thing when he leaves that job. And now he's saying another. And I want to know if there's anyone honest enough to admit that you've been through some incongruences in your life. You've been through some changes and some issues in your life and some inconsistencies in your communication in chapter 1 versus your communication in chapter 20. It's like God, when I, when I said yes in chapter 1, you didn't tell me about chapter 2 to 19. You didn't tell me that everybody was going to deny me. I thought great things were going to happen. You didn't tell me by the time I reached chapter 20, I'm like, you deceived me. I had an idea of what I was saying yes to, but it's nothing like what I was saying yes to. You showed me some parts of my calling, but you didn't show me all of it. I misunderstood the calling that you had for me. I misunderstood what you had for me to do in my relationships in life. And I want you to understand contextually what happened. God shared with Jeremiah what he would do. But he didn't tell Jeremiah that the most of the religious people that he was going to speak to wouldn't receive it. We have one idea. We have one idea starting that business. And then we have another idea after going through and barely sticking your head above water. We have one idea starting that job. 
starting that relationship, starting that friendship. And then all of a sudden something else happens. And our minds start to get cemented and we have to watch that. Because cement has no give. Cement cracks and breaks. And it's very difficult to repair cement. Jeremiah was listening to God tell him how he was anointed in chapter 1. But he didn't know that he was going to be rejected by all the people that he was anointed to help. Because God gives Jeremiah a prophetic ministry, but he gives him a unique prophetic message. Jeremiah has a choice now. Be faithful to the message that God gives him. And God didn't give Jeremiah a, 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 a wow, awesome message. God gave him an ow message, a message that hurt. He was talking about pain. He was talking about destruction that was going to happen. He was talking the fact that it's not going to be all smooth ground. Jeremiah was giving the people a reality check. See, because sometimes people serve God and think that all serving God is all about making everything go good and nothing could go wrong. Oh, everything's going to be smooth sailing now. Oh, no, 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 no. There are going to be storms, there are going to be thorns, and there are going to be crosses. Believe you me. And then add emotions and add the enemy trying to get us off track. It becomes almost an un, a, a difficult and impossible thing. But what I love about that is what's impossible for men is possible with God. And that when we come to Him and we trust Him, He's able to build all things new. He's able to change all things through new for, your, for His glory and for your benefit. The whole, there's a whole book that Jeremiah ended up writing called Lamentations. If you're ever in a bad or disappointed or, 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 or um, depressed mood, do not read Lamentations. Don't read Lamentations and don't read Job. <laughs> in fact, you might as well steer clear also of Ecclesiastes, for that matter. But Lamentations is where Jeremiah was lamenting. In fact, he was called the weeping pro prophet. Because many of his messages were messages that, had, that he had to deliver with grief. He had to deliver warnings to Israel regarding their recklessness. God, when you gave me this calling, you didn't reveal the inconveniences. You gave me this calling, you announced the call, but you didn't reveal the inconvenience. You gave me the calling, but you didn't give me the cross. I had to pick up the cross. We're coming to a close. I didn't know about that part. And there may be a part about your calling you don't fully understand and you're going through something now and trying to walk faithful with God and it could be that way in marriage it could be that way in ministry it could be that way in entrepreneurship why? because there's no such thing as the absence of problems there's only the exchange of them there's no guile in God there are times when I heap information upon you until you get to a place where I feel like it's necessary to be exposed to it. God prepares you for what you're going to go through. I want you to get so far into the journey that you have no other choice but to stick with your yes. That's God's heart. And afterwards, I'm going to carry you through it. He's the lifter of your head. He doesn't want you hanging your head a little like that. That's not believing. That's not trusting. I'm going to use the storms and the things that you go through to give you a revelation, not just of me, but of you. That's what God's saying. And you have to get yourself and them ready. Listen to Jeremiah. We're going to, we're going to close with this. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17 to 19. He says, get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them, for I will terrify you before them. 
Today, today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue you, declares the Lord. And this I want to say. If God's saying I have to rescue you, there's going to be times when you're going to be in prison. There are going to be seasons when you do for sure. What God's letting you know is that he already knows. He already knows your proclivities. He already knows when you're going to fail. And he's still standing there and he's still calling. He's still saying more of Dale. <laughs> he don't call you more. <laughs> we call you more. He's calling Susan, Cassandra, Brian, Brian, George, Jessica, Louise. He's calling yes, Chris. <laughs> Chris is not calling yes. He's calling Chris. If he's saying there's going to be a rescue, he's going to rescue you. He's already planning. Your escape route is through him. But that happens when you get ready to trust him and realize there's going to come a lot of things against you. But he already has your rescue plan in order. Will you stand? I'm saying now, what I want to say is how does Jeremiah get past God, you deceived me, and I've been deceived? How does Jeremiah get past it? I want to give you a couple of things really quickly, and then we're going to close. He says, Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult. Don't run away from the word of the Lord. See, many times when you're going through a hardship, your mind is so engrossed in the hardship that you're not, your mind is not in the word of the Lord. It's not until your mind is on the word of the Lord that there's freedom. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's not he who thinks himself free. Don't neglect the word of God. The next thing is, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. In other words, Speak the words of God. Speak the words of life. Pray and stay in communion with God. And in the times when you're wondering why everything's blowing apart, God will start to bring an answer and fruitfulness in your life. Hardship happened, but Jeremiah continued his ministry in the midst of captivity. And you might be going through a hard time and a hard situation in your life, a hard season. But if you continue on, God will continue to strive with you and keep you in the midst of all the turmoil that's happening around you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we ask in the name of Jesus that as we continue to think and consider your word, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would keep us from all from from the effects and from the difficulties of hardship in our lives we want our eyes focused upon you we want your word echoing and resounding within our minds and hearts we want to continue to move forward even when things don't seem to make sense Lord, you have a calling on each and every one of our lives, and we want to fulfill that, because in that calling and in that obedience is life abundant and grace. And we thank you for your goodness for each and every one of us and towards each and every one of us. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. Love you, brother.